Well, hey guys, welcome back to the podcast where we're talking to Rachel Cruz. And the reason I'm excited is because um, Rachel and I have many like mutual friends, but we've never actually, well, okay, I take that back. Rachel, first of all, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Jennifer. (laughs) Thanks for having me on. (laughs) Okay, so do you remember, um, okay, so Rachel is uh, the daughter of Dave Ramsey. Um, I adore your father. And so, and I have spoke at Business Boutique um, where you also, you know, are there and that's part of your world. And so I met you in a hallway at Business Boutique two years ago. Do you remember that? Yes, because it I was do. really weird and awkward. I think I said something really dumb, like, oh my gosh, it's so great to meet you. Your dad is Dave Ramsey. I love him. And then yeah. like ran. <laughs> I don't remember it being awkward at all, but I do remember meeting you because I know your name. Like you said, we have so many mutual people and then we were at Business Boutique, all of it. And I was like, yeah, we were passing each other, going to our own places. And I was like, Jennifer. So no, I totally yeah. remember. Yeah. Have you ever done that though, where you meet somebody that you're like, oh, you know, I really always wanted to meet this person. And then you like, just kind of blow oh, it. Oh, yes. Oh, okay. I remember I was at... Um, Catalyst. I was at a big Christian event somewhere. This was years ago, probably six years ago. And Jen Hatmaker was like, I was about to go on stage and she's right there. And she was like, hey, like we like made eyes. And I was like, Jen Hatmaker. She was like, hey, hi. And I was like, hi. And I was like going on stage. And we're thinking like, oh my gosh, that was like the weirdest interaction yes. ever to meet someone. So she's in my mind. So if I ever yep, meet her I, one day, I'll be like, I Sorry, totally, <laughs> I totally got it. I uh, I met Jen Hatmaker a couple of years ago, actually at Rachel Hollis's home. Okay, and yeah. Jen Hatmaker, it was like, we met eyes and I was like, Jen Hatmaker. And she was like, Jennifer Owen. And we like hugged so hard. I was like, oh my gosh, she's like the best real life hugger. And maybe that's just imprinted in my brain because it's the middle of coronavirus and we're not supposed to touch yeah, one another. Like, I don't know. We just want to hug all the time. <laughs> but, well, I'm glad to know you, you two have awkward uh, things happen. So oh, I'm going to sure. read just the tiniest bit of your bio because it's super impressive. Um, and so you are a two-time national best-selling author, which let me just say, now that I've got a book out in the world, that's not an easy feat <laughs> <laughs> to do not once, but twice. So congratulations, a financial expert and host of the Rachel Cruz show. So you've got a brand new book out called Know Your yourself, know your money, which helps you discover why you handle money the way you do and what to do about it. And the reason I love this book and I love this topic is because um, sometimes women are just weird about money, aren't we? Well, I think in general, people are just weird about money. Money carries so many emotions, so many connotations. Like there's so much. It's not just like dollars and cents. Like there is so much life around money. And so I think it's a really difficult and hard conversation for a lot of people. That's one reason I love my job. I love talking about it. I yeah. love getting people on a plan, find, helping them find this peace in their life, some control over it to be able to use it to create a life that they love. Like that's yeah. what it is. It's a tool out there to help us. And so, uh, but it carries a lot of baggage and a lot of hardship yes. for people. I would agree with that. I've talked um, numerous times, like inside of my coaching group and here on the podcast about just different ways that I was raised, which wasn't necessarily wrong, but just how they really shaped how I feel about money today and things I've had to undo in my own mind. And then I'm like, ah, crap, what am I doing to my kids? You know? And so, you know, when you knew better, you do better. And, um, and so, yeah, there, there is a lot of weight, um, around money and money topics. So tell me what inspired you to write this particular book. Yeah. So for gosh, 10 years, 11 years now, I've been talking about the how-tos of money. So I always talk about, you know, how to budget, how to get out of debt, how to invest, Mm -hmm. how to refinance, how to build wealth, how to give, like how to do all these things. But personal finance, it's 80% behavior. It's only 20% head knowledge. So Mm -hmm. we can have the head knowledge of the how-to, but until your behavior changes, then you're really not going to see progress because you can know what to do, but if you don't do it, it does no good. And so for me, probably about three years ago, I really dove into myself more, if you will. Like I, I remember taking the Enneagram. I was in some yes. counseling. Okay. And so what's like, your Enneagram? Let's talk about that. I, I still, it's a journey for me every, and I'm on so many Enneagram podcasts and I always am like, here's my number, but I think I'm still this. So I'm a three. Of course you are. I'm a three, yeah. but I really think I'm a Every seven. three can recognize another three <laughs> a million miles away. So of course you're a three. I know, but I, I feel like I'm a seven a lot of the time. I have oh. a lot of seven in me. I'm raising a seven. My you son, I, I was just literally on a, um, uh, I, I'm addicted to Voxer. I love Voxer. And so I'm like on this prayer thread with other women who are in kind of my industry. And um, and we were just talking about my son, Noah, our oldest, who is an Enneagram seven. So life is basically a party all the time. Yes, yes, yes. And I so relate to that. I love yes. it. But I, 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 I know I'm a three though. I think yes. seven will be very close. 
when yeah. I take the test usually, okay. but yeah. So all of that, but it's just right. But when I do read a three, I very mm-hmm. much relay and yes. all the good, the bad, the ugly of it. Yeah. And, and again, and, and had, have a great counselor. So Winston and I, like we did some mm-hmm. great marriage counseling about three years ago and it just, I was like, oh my gosh, like understanding myself was just yeah. huge. I just became, I have not arrived by any means, mm-hmm. but just a healthier person emotionally. And I was a better wife. I was a better mom. Mm-hmm. I was a better friend. I'm mean, like, you just can engage at a different level when you understand who you are. And that yes. self-awareness is really important. So I kind of was on that journey a couple of years ago. And then I was like, man, I talk about money 24 seven. Like it's my job. Yes. This is what I talk about. So I'm like, okay, so why do I handle money the way I do? How does this self-awareness, how, how does this affect my money? Oh my gosh, Jennifer, it like sent me in this black hole of just like content. I was like, this is a whole new world of personal finance that I never really tapped into ever. And even at Roomsy Solutions, we really haven't. And I'm like, so I kind of see it as I was, I went under the surface. So you can build a strong foundation above, yes. again, the how-to of, of how to be wise with your money. But until you understand yourself and going under right. that foundation, like it's so crucial because if you don't, I think money problems masquerade themselves mm-hmm. as, or I think real life problems masquerade themselves as money problems. Yeah. So if it's like, yeah, my spouse and I can't get on the same page about money, usually not a money issue. Usually there's other issues, right? Like, yes. or I, I, I tend to spend and I just get in so much credit card debt. Okay. Well, why? Starting to ask these questions to like understand you as a person. And so, yeah, I was like, I have to write a book about this. Oh, okay. So I just started the manuscript and that's how Know Yourself, Know Your Money came about. Okay. So I have so many questions. First of all, do you think that most people are married to somebody whose money habits are exactly opposite of theirs? Oh, I find that so true. Do you so think true. God does that on purpose? It's just unbelievable. to laugh. I, <laughs> no, just to be like, like well, yes. let's see how this happens. I mean, it's unbelievable. And like, and honestly, like with this book, I was like, oh, all these like aha moments yeah. happened. And I think you're able to, when you understand yourself better, you're able to empathize with others and your spouse. I wanted the word relationships somewhere in the subtitle of the book. It didn't make it, but like, yeah. <laughs> because it's such a big part of it. I'm like, I now have language and I understand Winston so much more now because I'm so aware of why he does the things he does with money. Yes. And instead of things would frustrate me now, I'm like, no, like it's a tendency yeah. he has. It's a fear he has. Like I can name it now and same to him with me. Right. Um, but yes. So amen. Hallelujah. Opposites all the way when it comes to marriage. So and are so, you the spender and is he the saver? Yep. I'm okay. the spender. He's the saver. Yeah. Yep. And that's exact opposite in our house. Um, so yeah, <laughs> I know it's, it's hard. Like it, it is, it, is, it yes. is. And it always goes back to like, you know, weird things. Um, um, and so I'm trying to get better at spending and I think he's getting better at saving. And <laughs> yeah. so, you know, I don't know if we've arrived yet either, but okay. So I know in the book, you talk a lot about money classrooms and I wonder if you would talk to us about that. What does that mean? How, how did you come about that sort of language? Cause it's kind of a cool yes. classroom. I like it. I like yeah, it. Yeah. Well, I heard, um, I think it was Dr. Les Perry. He once said that when you grow up your childhood home, it's like your classroom. Yes. And I was like, yes, it is. Like there's lessons you learn that you take with you into adulthood. There's some lessons you wish you could unlearn yeah. in adulthood, all of it. But that's really where you learn the bulk of your life is that is that childhood home. And so your money classroom is so important. And so I realized that money's communicated in two ways. It's communicated verbally and it's communicated emotionally. And so as I was writing the book, I like wrote this graph and I was like, oh my God, Jesus gave me a graph. I was like, I love graphs. And like, this is what it is. It's this quadrant, this beautiful quadrant of how money's communicated. So there's really four main money classrooms I talk about in the book. The first is the anxious money classroom. So this is if you grew up in a home where it was verbally closed, it was not talked about, money was not talked about, and emotionally stressed. So you could feel- Ding, 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 ding. (laughs) That was like, that was like, yes. And so this is a home that- Man, if, if money was brought up or there was a purchase that had to, something, you just felt the tension, tension. rise or toward the end of the yes. month, but it was never talked about. So you couldn't pinpoint it as a kid, but yeah. looking back as an adult, you're like, oh no, lots of money stress. Lots and of money I stress. would guess that that isn't just me. And we, I grew up in a home with money, by the way. But yeah, yeah, yeah. still tension. So it wasn't like we were broke and there was tension, there was money and there was still tension. So Amen. Yes. That's what's interesting too, is you can have $10 million or $10 in each of these classrooms, yeah. but it doesn't matter. The amount of money doesn't matter. It's how your parents handled it. Okay. So which class am I in? You're number one, the anxious money classroom. Anxious. Okay. Got it. Yep. Uh, Classroom number two is the unstable money classroom. And this is where it was verbally open, but emotionally stressed. So you probably heard your parents fight about this stuff. You probably heard them fight, have the same fight over and over again. 
They may have fought with extended family members about money. Yeah. Like it was out there, out in the open. So yeah. the conflict was there. Uh, classroom number three is the unaware money classroom. And this is where it's emotionally calm, but verbally closed. So okay. you're unaware, unaware of money because your head's kind of in the sand. You don't have to think about it because again, not a lot of attention, not a lot of big emotion around it, mm -hmm. but it was just never talked about. And it's interesting, people in this money classroom I've talked to as adults now, they have some resentment towards their parents because they realize that their parents are not in a good spot financially, but they always thought they were okay. They were like, no, my parents are fine with money. Like everything was fine. Interesting. And now they're realizing, oh, wow, no, mom and dad are okay. struggling or they're making really bad decisions, but no yeah. one's saying anything about it. Like, yeah, fascinating. And then classroom number four is the healthiest money classroom. And that's the secure money classroom. And this is where it's verbally open and emotionally calm. Okay. So again, you don't have to have a ton of money to be in that classroom, but, but that means that it's being handled well, the finances, it's controlled, your parents are on the same page, there's a plan, and they're willing to talk about it. They talk about it with each other, they talk about it with you kids, like growing up, like it, it's that secure wow. environment. So I do tell people in the present, the ideal is to move to that fourth money classroom with your present family, your nuclear family. But pinpointing how you grew up, though, is really important. And so it's funny, as I was writing this out, I wrote in the manuscript, like, I really feel like I grew up in classroom number four. My parents were not perfect by any means. But I was going to say, when Dave Ramsey's your dad, I would assume there was a lot of discussions around money. Yes. And, and it was, yep, they were on a budget and all of that. And so I told mom and dad one night at dinner, because I was talking about the manuscript, I was like, yeah, and I just wrote this whole section about the secure money classroom and yeah. blah, blah, blah. And I was like, and I feel like that's how we grew up. And they looked at each other and started laughing. And I was like, what? And they're like, well, that's because your memories only start when you're like four or five years old. <laughs> the years before that, that, we were in the unstable money yes. classroom. Yes. Lots of fighting, lots of tension because they filed for bankruptcy the year yes. I was born. So they're like, oh yeah, those first couple of years out of bankruptcy were not pretty. And you just don't remember. And I was like, oh, yeah. well, there you go. So you can move yeah. classrooms for sure. But, um, right. but yeah, it's just fascinating. But each classroom has their weaknesses. And yes. so I think just being able to pinpoint, okay, this is how I grew up. Mm -hmm. Here's what I can learn from that. And here are things that I need to watch out for that you may subconsciously kind of go into these other habits and just being aware of them. Yeah. Now, how old are your kiddos right now, Rachel? Because I know you have a couple. Am I right? I feel like I have 17. I have I, three, too, but I you feel like, like I have 17. Well, yeah. usually there's one that's like counts for double. <laughs> that's my middle. <laughs> yeah, we have Amelia is five. Okay. And so she's in kindergarten. Caroline is three. She uh -huh. gives us a run for our money. Yes. Oh, love her. And then Charles is one. He just turned okay. one. Yeah. So is the five-year-old old enough yet to start having money conversations or, you know, um, allowance, or I don't, I don't know what that would look like. I know that there was one time. Okay. So don't judge me about this. Okay. But, um, we've, we've always tried to really include our kids in money conversations just because I was raised in the seventies and you didn't talk about how much you made. You didn't talk about how much bills were. And so I went to college, not knowing a, a thing about a thing. I'm like, I don't know what uh -huh. anything costs. And so we've tried to do the opposite of that. We've literally at times had our kids write out like our tithe check you know, mm -hmm. for us, we'll sign it, but write out this, they know what our mortgage costs. They know when mom's doing a big launch, what the goals are. They'll ask me, but now they're teens. But when they were little, like your kid's age, I used to bribe my kids to memorize Bible scripture and I'd pay them $2 a scripture. <laughs> Is that horrible? No, no, especially if they're motivated by money. You're like, listen, <laughs> we can do this. <laughs> and what's funny is um, we just adopted um, a little six-year-old girl, Ari, but she's like the first one of my children unmotivated by money in the least. So that's, that's funny. No, that happens totally. Yeah. Well, Amelia and I, we, in the Ramsey family, we were always on commission. We okay. were not on allowance. Yes. So we had to work for everything. So we've kind of started implementing that with Amelia. She's five. Okay. So she, but she thrives. She's like typical firstborn, like responsible, yes. thrives yes. on affirmation, yes. doing good. Yes. She like, it's all the things. So she's kind of a dream in that sense. Like we'll be like, okay, make up your room. We'll give you a dollar or whatever, you know, make up your bed yes. and she'll go do it. So she saved up. She bought a Polly pocket for the Love. first time last Love. month. Yes. She was like beside herself. We had to explain Amazon oh. though, that like, Mom and dad's debit card is attached to Amazon. So we were like, she, we made her give us the money. Yes. But she was so confused because she's like, no, no, you can't keep the money. It has to go to the Polly Pocket. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> I know. It's online. We're buying Amazon online. is like, such a hard concept for kids. It's hard for me to wrap my head around Amazon, <laughs> let alone kids. But um, okay, so tell me, Rachel, right now, what are some of the tendencies that you're really seeing um, people have when it comes to spending their money right now? And like part B of that question is, has 2020 just changed everything? So like, what are you seeing for spending tendencies at the moment? 
Yes. Well, your tendencies are, are your tendencies no matter where you are. So like, it's just part of your DNA, your makeup. And I think being able to pinpoint them is really important. So I go through seven in the book, but a couple of them, we touched on spender versus saver. Okay. That's a tendency. Yeah. Um, there's experiences versus things. Ooh. So do you like to buy, yeah, to have vacation. an experience? Yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. Like a nice dinner out or a specific item. Yeah. And it was so funny. Winston, my husband and I, we got married super young, right out of college. And so that first couple of years, we laugh all the time because he refused to buy drinks at restaurants. He just wouldn't. He's like, no, that, that glass of wine, I can go buy a bottle water next place. door. <laughs> yeah. He, and he drank water for like two years. We went out to restaurants and it bothered me all the time. I was like, babe, have a glass of wine with me. Like I want to enjoy yes. this experience. And now I realize he just doesn't value experiences. Like yeah. he really would rather take that money and go buy yes. something that he can use. Mm-hmm. And he feels like his hard work has been put to good use. And so again, we, if I just had that vocabulary, that vernacular of, oh, you just That's value so things good. more than experiences. Yes. It would have helped my frustration. Yeah. Um, there's another one of quality versus quantity. Okay. I love this. Cause my husband is probably, he would spend money more on quality items and I'd rather get four shirts that are 20 bucks each. Girl, we're the same. Me too. No. Yes. Like my earrings. I'm like, give me 20 pairs of cheap earrings. That I, I know he's been like, do you want, would you like some really nice diamond earrings? I'm like, absolutely never. No. Do not <laughs> buy me. Other than my wedding ring, like don't buy me fancy jewelry. Take me to France. Yes. <laughs> but, I, but just buy, cubic zirconia is fine. That's right. That's exactly how I am. Where Winston's like, he just like, I need two nice pairs of jeans and that's all I need. I'm like, no, I'll go to, I'll go to loft and Taylor right. loft and buy a bunch of like 75% yes. sales and just yes. rack up. Uh, another one is abundance versus scarcity. Okay. Tell me about that one. What's so that? your mindset either with money is there's a, there's an unlimited oh. amount. We can all, oh, there's always more opportunity. Yes. There's always more to get. It's fine. If we spend here, it's, it's going to be okay because there's always yeah. more opportunity. We're scarcity mindset. They're a little bit, they're more planners. They think through purchases more. There's a level of security that they're like, you know what? I would just rather, I'd rather wait and see yeah. how it plays out. And just, yeah. So people, again, not right or wrong, just kind of how you're naturally wired. So I'm more abundance. Me too. Winston is more scarcity. Yeah. Can we both be the same thing in a marriage? Because I'm thinking yeah, both yeah. my husband are like, yeah, there's plenty. We just have to figure out how to get it. Yes. <laughs> you know oh, yeah, I mean? Both so. of us. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Totally. Okay. Awesome. So tell me, is has 2020 changed any of these tendencies? Are people moving around? Or um, I mean, I just feel like 2020 has kind of changed everything. Oh, it's changed so much. Yeah. Well, again, these tendencies are naturally just who you are. Like if you think yes. back to you as a kid, like where yeah. you just naturally were bent. But I think it's changed the way we look at money for sure. Warren Buffett always says that when the tide goes out, you can tell who was skinny dipping. And I love that picture because I'm like, it's true. Like when that, like we felt it through the recession, we felt it through 2020. Mm -hmm. And I think what it did, it just shook people up to say, okay, I never again want to have this moment of fear. Because there was a, there was so much fear, right? The the financial fear, the health fear. I mean, there was just so much in 2020. And so whether you were, you did lose a job or you were furloughed, or you had the fear that it was going to happen to you. Like it just was rampant. And so I think it really took people back to like, okay, people could kind of cover their money mistakes really well in the past because yeah. everyone was doing great, making good money, you know, economy was right. booming, all of that. And then when it halts, it really lets you see, okay, how are we really doing? And yeah. 40% of Americans that can't cover a $400 emergency in cash. So a lot of people wow. are just in this 40%, place where- 40%, say that again, 40%, 40% of Americans can't cover $400, a $400 emergency in cash. And so this living paycheck to paycheck, having no savings, it it worked when it worked, but when suddenly the money stopped, like, so I just, my prayer for it is, you know, obviously through 2020, I did so many interviews helping people get on a plan to like help them Mm -hmm. in this, but I do want it to be a wake up call. I hope it did shake off some of the bad habits that we all had with money and really kind of grounded us. So, okay, what are things that we need to do to set ourselves up well? Yeah. That's so, so good. Okay. So, um, my book fears, not the boss of you came out in the spring and obviously the topic was completely fear. And so I know you talk about in your book, um, fear and how it holds us back a lot of times with money. So tell me more about that. How does fear, um, is it just fear that we're not going to have enough or fear that we're, uh, because it's interesting how years ago when we were broke, when I called your dad on the old 800 number years ago, you know, and I was like, what do we do? Do we drain our 401k? We had just, um, 
we had Jason had just lost his job right before mm-hmm. Christmas. Our babies were all little, and he didn't get like his fourth quarter bonus and his end of the year bonus, and um, and the it, and the housing market had just tanked, and I was attached my job to the housing market. So anyway, um, so I remember then there was fear for me and Jason because we didn't have enough. Yep. And then as life has shifted and, and now we're in a complete, you know, totally different place financially, the fear is now more, Oh Lord, I hope I don't lose it all. You know what I mean? And I'm like, yeah. how do we get to a place where we're just like, it is what it is. And there's no fear wrapped in it. So tell me about that, the fear and money and what you talk yep. about. No, it's great. Well, there's six money fears I walk through. So one of them is that financial insecurity that if something happens, are we going to be okay? You know, mm-hmm. there's that fear. Um, there's a lot of fear of, I don't want to end up like my parents, yes. I heard that fear. Um, the fear of, I can't live out my dreams that like you're getting to a place in your life. You're like, wow, I only have X amount left and of life and money. And it's just not panning out the way it was. Uh, the fear that exter- external forces, if you will, are going to affect me. So government or corporate America or like all these other things are going to, are going to keep me from living my life. I mean, yeah. So there's six yeah. of those big fears, but the interesting thing about fear and I want your take on this because you wrote a whole book on it. Yeah. I was talking to Dr. Chip Dodd about it. And he talked about how fear can be such a gift, though. Mm-hmm. That there's moments where, where yeah. fear literally is your body's response saying, mm-hmm. I need help. I'm in need. Yes. And so when it turns into anxiety, like it gets real bad, real fast, yes. very yes. unhealthy. Yeah. But to say like, yeah, there's a bear running at me. You're going to exactly. have fear. So God what do I need to do? I have fear on purpose. Yeah. That's like, right. Like, yes. The edge of a cliff or my kids do. I want them to feel fear. <laughs> That's and right. they'll back on up. Yeah. So that sort of fear is, is, yeah, I think a gift from God in order to keep us alive. Right. So I think applying that mindset to money and to say, okay, if you have these financial fears, the things that keep you up at night, what are things that your body's response telling you things need to be different? What do you need to put in place to help with that? Maybe it's tactical. Maybe it is an emergency fund because what if something does happen and you lose your job? Yeah, there's a chance that, yeah, it could get really bad really fast. So what what safeguards do you need to put in place there? Um, if you owe a bunch of debt, maybe you start working your way of paying that off. Like, like what are things you can put in place? And then there's the emotional side. And it's exactly what you said, which I loved. I've heard people say this, like, okay, I've actually won financially in a sense. Like I, I have, this is me. Like, I'm like, we have an emergency fund for our emergency fund. Like we have our 401k, our, like, like I'm fine. Like on paper, I'm fine. But there's still this element. And I felt this in 2020. I had a few moments with Winston where I was like, babe. Yeah. What if, what, like, we don't know. Like, especially yeah. April, it was like, what is happening to our world? Like, yes. are we going to be okay? I mean, yeah. So like no amount of money I've realized for me, I, I put too much security in it. And it kind of caught me in guard, off guard where I was like, man, I really have, I have put a level of security in that savings account, in that money market account. Yes. It probably is a level of unhealth, like a level where I'm like, wow, I'm, I am, I didn't realize it, but I kind of am trusting this more than God. Right. And it woke me up emotionally yes. to say, wow. So yeah. it just, it, so those, when those fears come up, just start asking those questions, why? And are there things that you need to put in place to safeguard against problems that may come that can help, but there's also the heart and emotional issues to overcome too. Yeah. What I find is really interesting is when we were broke, um, I think that level of fear of just like, how are we going to get through this? Um, it's interesting to me, I because in my head, I thought, oh, once we get to this amount of money in the bank, like all these problems will go away. Do you want to hear something really funny, Rachel? So I can remember um, I started working when I was 19 years old, um, not one, but two jobs, bought my first home when I was 21. So I've always worked. I've always been super responsible. I, I write about that in my book about being a really super responsible person. Always wanted to make sure that I had plenty of money to fall back on, you know, should something happen. But it's interesting. I can remember when I was young and I thought if I could just make 20 $8,000 a year. I would never have to worry about money again. <laughs> I'm like, oh my gosh. I, uh-huh. you know, I just 28,000 a year. I mean, you can't even live on that anymore. Uh-huh. And so like one of the things, you know, that, uh, that I'm really trying to work on mentally is like, when is enough enough? Mm-hmm. What, it, what is enough? What is the magic number, Jen, that's going to make you go, okay, you're, you're fine. And you don't have to worry. Like, you know what I'm saying? And it's not oh, that absolutely. I'm staying up at night, you know, obsessing about things, but it's interesting. Like the, you know, there was a fear at one point of, um, you know, because we didn't have enough. And then now there's on the other side, okay, we have enough, but we're also, we've got a lot more responsibility. I've got, you know, eight people who work for me. We've got family that we help, you know what I'm saying? And so we've swung in the opposite direction. And so, um, I, I just, I know that years ago when I wished that I 
was where I am today, I didn't realize there would still be fear attached to it. It's almost like when I look back on pictures of myself now at 30 and at 30, I thought I was so chunky. And I was like, oh my gosh, what I would do to come back to to that waist. You know what I mean? And so it always, anyway, I think what I'm just trying to say is, I think this is a fascinating topic because at every level and or every quadrant or whatever you want to call it or classroom, there's still stuff. Yes. Oh, absolutely. And I think I read a study a few years ago and talked about how the finish line always moves. So there was a study done. They talked to people that made $50,000. So they're like, are you rich? Have you arrived? Like, oh no, I'll arrive and I make a hundred thousand. Yeah. We talk to people making a hundred thousand. Have you arrived? Do you feel rich? Are you good? No, no, no. If I made like 250 a year, that would be awesome. You go talk, right. And it just, there was never, I mean, they got up to $15 million a year and they're like, nah, like 25 million. It'd be good. It'd be good. Like it is always moves. So I think there's, there's a level where we have to address that. What does that that, say about us as humans? Do I, I know. Right. And I think there's an element of good, right. There's an element of like, yeah, you, you always, you know, you're striving to be better. You're, you're gaining all that. Like that's, there's a level that's healthy there. There's also a level of contentment that I feel like we all need and it's, and it can be so hard. It can be so hard. Yeah. So good. Okay. So tell me what advice you would have for someone who has trouble saving money. Yeah. Saving is tough because it's, it's one of these things that tactically you have to do and, and to get these quick wins is important because some people truly, they can't, they, they don't know how to save. They don't save. And so tactically putting it, you know, every month say, I'm going to put X amount away, no matter what, no yep. matter what this has to get, this has to be put away. So, I mean, working on it at that end, but also I find when people don't save, they're not dreaming. Like they don't have big goals for their life. They're not out there like really saying, okay, what does my future look like? What do I want my life to look like in mm-hmm. five, 10 years? Right. And I've attached dreaming and saving. Like when you dream and allow yourself to go there, your savings follows because you actually have something you're working towards. I mean, there's like the basic emergency fund, which is what you yeah. save for, uh, which is important, but everything else above and beyond that, you know, for me as a spender, I usually feel like if we do have extra money, we put in investments or something. I'm like, it just feels like this black hole of like, I'm working hard. And it's just going in this black hole of like, golly, but I have to realize, no, like it, that's attached to something. So when my, yes. when my savings is attached to a dream or a goal, mm-hmm. it makes it so much easier for me. And so I find, you know, in 2020, I think it was really hard for people to dream. It was like survival yeah. mode yes. but to really allow yourself to say, what do I want my life to be? What yeah. do we want to do? And when you do that, the savings follows. That's so good. So, so good. Okay. So are bad money habits changeable? Yes, they are. <laughs> it's hard. It's hard. Yeah. I mean, all change is hard, right? Like if yes, you're comfortable and doing what you're doing, it's yes. uncomfortable to change. But, but the thing is, is that what you're changing for, you have to have hope that that future is better than your present. Like if I tell you to sacrifice and don't buy clothes, don't go out to eat, don't go on vacation for a year and pay off your debt. If I'm telling you just to do that stuff and sacrifice, like without, an, without something better on the other end, you'd be crazy. Like who right. would do that? But you have to believe, okay, I'm changing these habits because in the future that that life is going to be better than what I'm in now. So you, that hope is so key. And I think that's a big part of money too, that people lose hope. They lose yeah. hope that they can change. Yeah. They lose hope that their situation can't get better. They just lose hope. But to know that you do have control over certain things, there's certain things we can't control. Yeah. We all know that we've experienced that in 2020, yep. <laughs> things we can't control, but there are things we can. And so the things that you can be wise and steward those decisions really well and, and say, okay, you know what, what are things that I can do now mm-hmm. in my control that I can change to better my future. And that's really what you have to do. So yes, they are money habits for sure are changeable, but it takes work. It takes sacrifice and it takes a level of being uncomfortable, but that's a good thing. Yeah, for sure. Okay. So I'm going to put you on the spot. Um, and not going to ask you to make any predictions, but how do you see, you know, things going economy wise in 2021? Is there, well, it's funny because after, uh, the election, whenever that date was, yeah. but like when they announced seems like 20 years ago now, yeah, I know, like- I know <laughs> it's crazy, but like the market shut up with like the vac, you know, the announcements, oh. of the vaccines, all of it. So I'm like, I, I mean, I'm the worst at predicting like in 2020, I had, a, I was on a podcast in May and I literally said, I think by like July 4th, like stuff is going to start getting back to normal. So I'm obviously I mean, you know what? not quite predicting. something about like that too. Like I think by the middle of the summer. Yeah. Yeah. We fine. I know. I know. So, I mean, like, I, I don't know what I know is again, is like, we can't, we don't have a crystal ball. We can't control right. it. So being smart with what you're doing yeah. now. It's so good. So important. It's so, so important. Okay. I'm going to ask you a couple rapid fire questions. Tell me your all time favorite book. All-time favorite book, um, oh, Chip Dodd, Voice of the Heart. Oh, you read that? I don't know that. No. Dr. Chip out. Dodd, 
Oh my gosh. I mean, it's in my, this was in my whole discovering myself. It's the, it's the eight, it's the eight emotions we all have as, as human beings. And he only names eight and it's fascinating, fascinating. And they all seem negative, but he, I love it. Cause he walks around and it's not. So the, so it's fear. Let me see if I can do this one. Huh? This okay. is a good, this is a good test for me. Okay. Fear, anger, guilt, shame, joy, or gladness. He says gladness. Um, oh, you're so close. Oh, no, no, no. Gosh, I have three more. Hold on, I can do this. I can do this. Um, you're going to remember. Lo loneliness, loneliness. Loneliness, okay. Um, oh, Jennifer, man. Anyways, there's so two close. more. I can't remember. Okay. But, but what's fascinating is you start to see, like, he talks about how we just live in a tragic world, but God's given us these eight gifts of emotion. Mm -hmm. And when you can pinpoint it and name it, it changes so much, like so much. And it's really these eight. He goes through other um, feelings. So they're not feelings, but these right. eight true emotions. Mm -hmm. And like, oh, okay. oh, how anger, here's, here's this little tidbit. Anger is the only emotion that's always attached to another. So when you are angry, there's always something else underneath. Yes. It's either fear, it's fear. sadness, yes. it's shame. Oh, fascinating. So fascinating. Good. Okay. It's so good. So Dr. Chip Dodd, I'm going to go get it. Okay, your yeah. favorite room in your house. Favorite room in my house. Mm -hmm. We just, well, we built a home that we actually, I'm friends with one of my, one of my neighbors is your good friend. Yes, we have a mutual friend, Adrian. Yeah. Yes. Um, and we built a fun master area. We said that that was like one of our goals of the yeah. house. We were, we just like love to retreat back there. So my yeah. master room. Love, 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 love. Favorite place to vacation when we can vacation. Come on, Lord, <sighs> fix it. Okay. So like family, kids, all of that. We always go down to like Rosemary beach area in, Flor yeah. in Florida. Oh. That's great. Okay. But okay. This is gonna sound super bougie and I'll be honest. We didn't pay for it. It was okay. a business thing. Okay. The most amazing place. Are you ready? Yes. The Ritz reserve. Okay. So there's only like four reserves of the Ritz. It's like a level above the Ritz. I'm so, it's very bougie. And again, we didn't pay for it. So I'm like, he's like, in Puerto Rico. Mm. The Ritz Reserve in Puerto Rico. It is the most magical, beautiful place I think I've ever been to. Fabulous. Okay, last question. To define freedom, what does freedom look like for you? Freedom for me, um, I think it's a, it's a level of peace mm -hmm. that I would have um, to know that there's certain things, like we talked about, I can control certain things I can't mm -hmm. and being totally okay with that and saying, you know what, God, like, Overall, you direct my steps and live in life like this. And it's yes. like, I just have peace there. Yeah, I, I have peace. I feel like I've done that more recently in my life than I ever have. And it just feels good. I feel like I can breathe. Awesome. I love it. Rachel, I just appreciate you. So tell people where to go find your book. So it's called Know Yourself, Know Your Money. Where would you prefer for them to go look at it? Because I've got a really great audience and I know that there's going to be people who are like, I want it. Do you want them to go to Amazon? Where do you want them to go? Oh, thank you. I mean, honestly, anywhere. I'm good. We, yeah, I've kind of stopped the chasing all the all the formulas of trying to do everything. Cause it's crazy. The book world is crazy. Yes. So honestly, yeah, rachelcruz.com, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, anywhere books are sold. Okay. And if Thank they you. wanted to reach out to you on social, where do you like to play? Facebook, Instagram? Yes. Uh, I love Twitter. Instagram. Instagram, yep. And I have a podcast and a YouTube show as well. So you can check that out, The Rachel Cruz Show. Rachel, thank you so much for being here. When I come to Nashville again, let's, um, let's have that glass of wine together. Absolutely, Jennifer. Thanks for having me on. Bless you, girl.